to Swinbrook's Thought for the Week. As always, you're welcome whether you are a regular or a newcomer, and I do hope and pray that what we do here will be useful for you in your spiritual journey. This Sunday marks the beginning of a new series of ten sermons which are grouped under the theme of Jesus' power, authority and victory. Each week we will look at Christ's power, authority and victory over a different issue or situation. This week's initial message is Jesus' power, authority and victory over our lives. It looks like a great series and I am very privileged to start us off. Our reading for this week is Mark chapter 1 verses 4 to 20. Jamie will do the reading for us. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptised by him in the river Jordan. John wore clothing made of camel's hair, with a leather belt round his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness for forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Jamie and Benny, for the reading. Our new series is about Jesus' power, authority and victory over various issues and situations. In this initial sermon, the focus is our lives, and our text is a slab of Mark 1 that Jamie just read to us. Because of the layout of the text, and because we are going to think about Jesus' power, authority and victory in a very broad sense in this whole series, there are two things to take away from this first part of the passage. First, there is Jesus' power, authority and victory over all things. And second, there is Jesus as Lord of individuals within kingdom communities. Although the application of this passage comes in the last few verses, there are a few big chunks to get straight in our minds before we think about Jesus' interaction with his disciples. The first chunk goes from verse 1 to verse 8. What Jesus is doing and is going to do are strongly connected to Isaiah, possibly the greatest prophet in the Old Testament. A messenger will come and prepare the way for the Messiah. Jesus didn't come from nowhere. He fulfills and builds on the Old Testament. John the Baptist is a fascinating character and it's a shame we can't do justice to him here. Although he was a contemporary of Jesus, some theologians call him the last Old Testament prophet because of his uncompromising words, unusual clothing and strange diet. A voice calling in the wilderness is often associated with spirituality, getting closer to God and times of testing and refining. When this strange character appeared, he issued a call to repentance. He was telling people they needed to change and get back to doing things God's way. When he invited baptism as a physical, outward demonstration of a change of heart, 
the response was amazing. Verse 5 tells us that many people in the countryside and the city went out to him. They knew their own spiritual dryness, and John's message struck a chord. As people bought in to what John was saying and received a spiritual new start, he moved on to the second part of his message, preparing the way for and introducing Jesus. John was clear that although people have to recognize their spiritual poverty and commit to do something about it in front of others, they need help from outside, from God himself. John refers to this mysterious figure, greater than himself, whose work would be similar to his own but more powerful. When Jesus came to announce and demonstrate the kingdom, he would bring the power of the Holy Spirit to help those who followed him. Verses 9 to 11. This is why Mark puts the baptism and testing of Jesus here. We know who Jesus is and what he has achieved for us. But at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, even people who knew their Bibles well would have struggled to put it all together. It's important that after being introduced rather obliquely by John, Jesus is now authenticated and empowered by his Father. In Mark's Gospel, not much detail is given. If you want a fuller account of some of this stuff, you have to look in the other Gospels. Mark's Gospel is always considered short and to the point. Some biblical scholars describe it as, as urgent or even breathless, the action moving quickly from one scene to another. Jesus, the unique God-man, now comes to John and identifies with humanity. John baptized the one whose sandals he was not worthy to untie. This remarkable person, who would do amazing things beyond our imagination, comes and undergoes baptism to show that he is one of us and with us. As Jesus comes out of the water, the whole trinity is revealed. The power and authority of the Spirit descend on him, and the voice from heaven confirms him as the beloved Son of God, proof that Jesus was approved by God and empowered of God. Verses 12 and 13. After approval comes testing. An intense spiritual battle at the highest level follows as Jesus is sent out into the desert to be tempted. Mark does not give us much detail, but the other Gospels tell us that, fresh with the blessing of God the Father and full of the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is victorious in round one of the battle for humanity. We tend to think of Jesus' power, authority and victory after the crucifixion, resurrection and ascension. We see the big picture, and our understanding includes the complete victory of Christ described in the book of Revelation. Perhaps we can think of these as complete power, complete authority, and complete victory. At the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, his ultimate victory over Satan and sin still lay in the future. And at this early stage, Mark introduces what we might call partial or initial power, authority, and victory. Verses 14 to 15. All of this is the background to two very important actions on Jesus' part. In these verses, Jesus proclaims the good news of the kingdom in the broadest cosmic sense. Everything is about to change as heaven begins to come to earth. More narrowly, Jesus begins his ministry with a small group of people in verses 16 to 20. These actions couldn't be more different. One is all-encompassing, while the other is very focused. But they are linked by Jesus, his power, authority, and victory. The broad brushstrokes of the kingdom must be complemented by the fine detail of its work in people's lives. The two cannot be separated. Verses 16 to 20. With these demonstrations of who he is and what he is about, Jesus begins to build his team. The first people that Jesus called were fishermen, hardworking, honest to goodness, ordinary blokes. He knows what is in store for them, even though they have no idea. Some biblical scholars think that Jesus had met them before, which is why they followed him apparently without question. Others like to think it was Jesus' sheer charisma. Still others see a supernatural call. I don't know. But it is unlikely that, that they had no idea of who Jesus was. What with the buzz caused by John the Baptist, the drama of Jesus' baptism, and then his strange disappearance during the temptation. It seems to me that these men were looking for a deeper understanding of and a relationship with God. John's radical teaching and his preparation of the way for Jesus must have spoken to them. In some elementary way, these men had grasped and been grasped by something of Jesus' power, authority, and victory. Mark's usual breathless language describes their response, at once, and they left. 
The leaving of the nets marks a new orientation in their lives, and the leaving of the father suggests a new series of relationships. They follow Jesus. Following is such an important concept in the scripture and the Christian life. To follow someone is in some way to emulate that person, to do the things that he or she does, to sign up to their agenda. A follower is a disciple. The calling of these first disciples is a small event about which not much detail is given, and we shouldn't use the detail we do have to define rigidly our understanding of following. So, following Jesus does not necessarily mean throwing in our jobs and doing something completely different, or totally renegotiating our relationships with family and friends just because we have decided to follow Christ. This makes for exciting stories of missionary daring do, but doesn't help most ordinary Christians. Indeed, the Bible and church history are full of people who have followed Jesus while remaining in the same job and social sphere. We make a difference by living and behaving in tune with Jesus' way and principles. To be honest, having been involved in full-time Christian mission for a long time, and having taught theology and mission in Bible colleges in Southeast Asia, I have more respect, if that is the right word, for so-called ordinary people who live out their faith in the real world of work, business, education, and family. In summary, Mark has shown us that Jesus links God's purposes revealed in the Old Testament and carried forward into the New. We have seen how John the Baptist taps into a vein of spiritual longing and points people to God. Also, from the very beginning of the Jesus movement, the idea of repentance as fundamental change of direction and orientation is present. While we must recognize our need, the powerful change comes from God himself. Finally, we see the micro and macro of God's purposes for his people as individuals following him manifest and extend his kingdom on earth. We know so much more than these first four disciples and our understanding of God's power, authority and victory over our lives is deeper and greater. Let's follow Jesus. Yeah.
Many thanks to David for the song. And now Nadine will lead us in our prayers. Creator God, we glimpse your beauty in setting sun, mountaintop, eagle's wing. We sense your power in thunder crash, lightning flash, and ocean's roar. Creator God, we praise you. Precious Jesus, we see your love stretched out upon the cross. We stand in awe at your sacrifice. Pure love poured out for mankind. Precious Jesus, we praise you. Holy Spirit, we see your power in lives transformed, hearts on fire. We listen for your still, small voice, comforting, guiding, calling. Holy Spirit, we praise you. Dear God, we humbly come before you in total appreciation for all that you have done for us. Thank you, Jesus, for enduring so much suffering on our behalf. We pray that we may have the same kind of strength to endure life for your sake. We repent of anything displeasing to you. We know you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Heavenly and merciful Father, guide our thoughts, words, and deeds. Help us not to yield to temptation. Help us to follow in the footsteps of Christ and remain pure and holy and walk by the Spirit, not gratifying the desires of the flesh. Jesus, you call us to follow you just as you called your disciples. Help us to believe that we are all ordinary people made extraordinary through your vision and your power. Take our insecurities and feelings of inadequacy and give us the courage to see ourselves and others as you see us, with gifts and potential to transform your world and build your kingdom. Holy Spirit, enable us to hear and recognize the call of Jesus in our lives. Help us to find appropriate and life-giving ways to spread your good news in a way which draws others to you and helps them experience your radical and extraordinary love. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry. O who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will save. I who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright. Who will bear my light to them? Whom shall I send? I will go, Lord. If you lead me, I will hold your people in my heart. We pray that the leaders in every country of the world to hold the people they govern in their hearts. Let them speak and act with honesty and integrity in all situations. Give them a glimpse of how much you love them and how much you love the world you created. Draw them into an ever closer relationship with you. Speak to them in the quiet moments as well as amid the chaos. Soften their hearts and make them true servant leaders. We pray that we will hold your people in our hearts as a church community and as individuals. We pray for our unbelieving family members, friends, colleagues and neighbors to draw closer to you. We pray for opportunities to demonstrate your love for them and to speak of the hope that is in us with sensitivity and yet confidence. We pray that when we seize that opportunity, you would guide our words and we would give glory to you. I, the Lord of wind and flame, I will tend the poor and lame. I will set a feast for them. My hand will save. Finest bread I will provide till their hearts be satisfied. I will give my life to them. Whom shall I send? I will go, Lord, if you lead me. 
I will hold your people in my heart. Heavenly Father, during this pandemic and great time of uncertainty, we remember the vulnerable, either physically, mentally, or financially. We pray they would get enough help to get through this difficult time the best they can. Let us be your hands and feet wherever and whenever possible. As we are sent out into the world this week, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We are almost at the end of our time together. I hope this time has been a blessing. Lord, we thank you that we can be about your business this morning. Thank you for speaking to us and listening to us. And a final closing prayer. May there always be work for our hands to do. May your purse always hold a coin or two. May the sun always shine upon your window pane. May a rainbow be certain to follow each rain. May the hand of a friend always be near you. And may God fill your heart with gladness to cheer you.